Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. How's everybody doing this evening? Good. Yes. All right. Wonderful, wonderful. My name is Dennis Bryant, and I just want to thank you all for coming out this evening for our candidates forum, District 6, here in Southwest Detroit. Uh, just a brief sum about myself. I'm the moderator today, and I'm Dennis Bryant, and I am a precinct delegate. And we just want to thank you all for uh, coming out this evening on behalf of uh, United Precinct Delegates. And real short, real quick, I'm gonna have a young man I met a few years ago on the campaign trail. Good guy, his name is Edward Martell. Just talk to everybody about the importance of uh, being a precinct delegate. How's everybody today? Good. Uh, as Mr. Bryan said, thank you, sir. I'm Edward Martell. Um, in 2016, I was elected as the first Latino ever uh, as a precinct delegate in the city of Romulus. This year, I'm running for city council in the city of Romulus. And I just want to talk to you for two seconds about the importance of precinct delegates. How many precinct delegates do we have in here today? See, that's a blessing. And as you all might have heard recently, there's a movement to try to decrease the number of precinct delegates within our district and neighboring districts. So it's so important that we take advantage of the opportunity because the precinct delegate is the lowest level of uh, elected official, but it's, it's one of the most important. And, it, and it's a springboard for any type of community organizing and community building. Uh, when my grandparents came to Southwest Detroit in the 1950s, uh, it was for to work at the auto plants. Uh, and since that time, you know, many um, many of us of that being Latino, we have trickled down river. I'm in Romulus, my grandparents are in Van Buren Township. Uh, you know, we have family in Taylor, we have family in Woodhaven, uh, Lincoln Park, Melvindale, you name it, there's Latinos uh, residing there. Unfortunately, we don't have representation within those communities. And I just want to tell you uh, just briefly how important it is that our population is represented, okay? Whether it be African American, whether it be Latinos, wherever we reside, we need to be on the ballot, okay? And, and it's important. And so, again, uh, get involved, uh, uh, precinct delegates, um, and I'm Edward Martell, and again, I'm candidate for city council in Romulus. And thank you all for having, or thank you all for being here today. And thank you to Alvaro Lopez for uh, hosting this event today. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Okay, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started here with a quick rundown of the duties of city council. Uh, depending on what order you feel like is, is important, so I'm just going to run down. Run down some of some of their duties. Uh, we 
review and approve contracts submitted by the mayor and other city departments, review, change, and approve the city budget, review and approve the sale or disposition of city property, review and approve employee requests for legal representation, <coughs> review and approve requests for rezoning of property, review and approve development agreements, and review complaints and petitions from, pub from the public regarding city operations and departments. That's some of the, some of the duties of city council. Uh, without further ado, we're just gonna start off going from left to right, starting with Mr. Tyrone Carter. Mr. Carter, you have a brief two-minute introduction on about yourself and your campaign. If I may. Yes, sir. Being a gentleman. <laughs> First place. Okay. Yeah. Well then, Ms. Lopez. Thank you. Good evening, Sorry. everyone. My name is Raquel Castaneda Lopez. I represent District 6. Currently, I'm the Detroit City Council. I was elected in 2013 when we first went to the District Council system um, and have worked tirelessly to represent District 6. It's District 6 covers downtown to Dearborn, the waterfront up to 96 in West Chicago. So it's much, much larger than the Southwest Detroit community. It is the most diverse by far, not just ethnically and racially, but also in terms of challenges as it relates to economic issue, so to speak, um, but an honor to serve in this role. When I won, I also became the first Latino to serve in this role, but diversity, equity, and inclusion is something that's incredibly important to me, which is why I'm running for re-election, to make sure that all of the neighborhoods across the district have equal representation and to make sure that everyone has a seat at the table. And so that for the past couple of years, we've really fought to make sure that happens by working with public schools to make sure that public schools stay open, to having a mobile office, the only one in the, the state of Michigan, to bring resources to neighborhoods, to having a fully staffed service center that's open Monday through Friday in partnership with the state representative. And with that, I look forward to you answering your questions and hopefully I'll get your support. Thank you. all of her time, I'm going to take some. Good evening, everybody. I'm Tyrone Carter. I'm a candidate for District 6. A little bit about me. Born, raised, educated, graduated from Southwestern High School, started with the Sheriff's Department in 1984, retired after 25 years at the rank of lieutenant. During that time, I was the union vice president, union steward, bargaining committee chairperson, and represented every member in the department. After retirement, I worked at Wayne County Community College for two years in charge of all of their campus security. We went from being campus safety to an actual police force that you see today. After that, I worked at Southwestern High School. My job was a community 
involvement specialist, which meant, which meant, let's find a different way of suspending and keeping kids in school because they had closed Chatsy and sent the kids from Chatsy to Southwestern. So they were ex uh, kicking kids out because of tardiness. Well, it's not their fault. They had to catch two buses and walk two miles. So we had to come up with a different strategy. After Southwestern closed, I started a business, but in the meantime, for the last eight years, I've been the president of my neighborhood organization. And last weekend, we finally had a huge victory. When the city's been closing recreation centers, before anybody was talking about community benefit agreements, we were at 48217. We got $2 million. We're going to open up Kimity Recreation Center next year, which is going to be a beacon of hope in an otherwise desolate area. The reason I'm running is because every district representative needs to represent every neighborhood regardless of their needs. I'm one of seven kids and my mother used to say, I love all my kids just differently. And I think we have to take that approach with each neighborhood. Port Town is different from Delray. Midtown is different from Mexican Town. 4217 is different from Chadsey. And downtown will be downtown. So with my background and my experience, I guarantee you the best way to figure out what a person's going to do is look at what they've done. And I've been successful everywhere I've gone, and I plan on being successful this time as well. Again, Tyrone Carter, candidate for District 6, City Council. Thank you. Um, is there any questions uh, from the audience for the, for the candidates? Yes, ma'am.
And it is out of our jurisdiction, but I think the number one thing that we can do as citizens is help protect those that need that protection. We can be their voice. We can speak up for them. We can share information on them. There's little pamphlets that I hand out, and it's about cardstock size that says, if you're approached, what can you do if you're an immigrant? If you're if you're legal here, how can you help that immigrant? There's two different cards that I hand out. And I think the key for us is information because it's out of our jurisdiction. However, we can let them know what their laws, what the laws are and what they can do if either one are approached and how we can help them and step up for them because we have to be their voice. So since being elected on the city council, my first year I created the immigration task force and one of the subcommittees of the immigration task force actually focuses on immigrant rights. And so we worked within that first year to become the, uh, the 41st welcoming city in the country. And part of that plan was to make Detroit more uh, welcoming to everyone in general through language access and translation, through making sure that people understand what their rights are within the city of Detroit. So we, when the, after Trump's executive orders came out, we actually established a stakeholder meeting with both the leaders of ICE and Border Patrol. We just had our first meeting maybe a month or two ago and agreed to meet quarterly. And so those are representatives from different nonprofits, from churches, some members from the DACA community that actually sat down and met with the director of ICE and with Border Patrol to talk about what their practices all are. So while it falls without our jurisdiction, there are things that we can do within city council to be able to create a more welcoming environment. In addition to the stakeholder meeting, we worked with the mayor to create the first ever Office of Immigrant Affairs in 2015. Um, right now, they're actually in a search for a new director and they'll be expanding the office to have an assistant director and an outreach person. Um, we also have annually a citizenship workshop that we host in our office where attorneys come down and provide free legal services for people to be, uh, be able to apply for citizenship. And the fourth Friday of every month, we also have an immigration attorney come in to answer questions and help provide guidance to people. So in addition to kind of the task force, the Office of Immigrant Affairs, the stakeholder meeting with Border Patrol and ICE, we are currently looking at our own anti-profiling legislation, which is on the books, which is something that not only impacts immigrant communities, but also impacts the African American community. So the legislation prevents uh, the police force about asking about immigration status. We want to strengthen it to just clear up some of the loopholes that currently exist. Um, and right now, the, the police department does not and should not ask people about their immigration status. And we, well, during the stakeholder meeting, when we had conversations with ICE and Border Patrol, oftentimes the raids and things that, well, they're not raids, but the, the pickups that happen, um, happen outside of the city of Detroit. So now it's kind of working with other municipalities to work with their police departments. Yeah. Then are they going to start asking questions that may impact me and my lifestyle? 
So it's more than just, you know, the scare. It's real for a lot of people. So we, we need to address that because people are going to like be taken advantage of. It's already happened. People already disordered. We got kids ending up in the system. Absolutely. But I think the key to that is that the school is a safe zone. If the parent walks into the school, they can't go into the school. The parent can just step right into the school. They cannot go into the school. So it's a safe zone. You can call and get them removed from trying to take parents from the school area. Yes, sir. Um, I live here, I'm a resident in District 6. This subject is very important to me as a person because I'm a government. I do not look like it. I am. I'm documented, though. And the problem that I have since I've been in District 6 has been exemplified by some of the comments that have come from the candidates. First, immigration is a federal issue. They can go into schools, their house, anywhere they want, and the news have already shown they have been doing that. Secondly, uh, it's a general issue of constitutional rights. Uh, the Supreme Court and the federal courts have already ruled that undocumented aliens do not have the same constitutional protections of a U.S. legal resident or citizen. In the story, they have ruled. My question, though, is kind of like two parts, starting with uh, Council Person Ruth Lopez. Uh, I think this lady here kind of alluded to it. What do you think about the activities of Trump and ICE and the deportations in relation to the rights, if any, of the undocumented aliens in District 6? Example. If ICE walked in here today, which they have the right to do, and start checking ID, which they have the right to do, and someone in here is undocumented, and you see ICE take them out, beat them on the head, throw them in a the car, and you don't see them again, do you feel that person has any constitutional protection, even though the federal government and the president has said, Thank you. What do you think? So I would say, one, when Trump uh, announced his executive orders, we were the first office, as well as Council President Jones, to issue multiple resolutions reaffirming our commitment to being welcoming and to rec welcoming refugees and immigrants, regardless of their immigration status, that we stood in support and attended the rallies at the airport and with the Muslim and the Yemeni community in Dearborn, um, and got the mayor as well to issue a statement reaffirming his commitment to protecting all of those people and their rights. So that, that should go unquestioned, that the city of Detroit stands 100% behind all the people in the city, regardless of their immigration status. As it relates to constitutional rights, I mean, there's so, although ICE is a federal aid, agent, they don't necessarily stand above the law, right? So that's why when we saw Trump's orders come out, there was attorneys that came to fight for those individuals. So ICE were to come in tonight and start beating up an individual. I mean, there's a team of attorneys that we could call in very quickly that would go and try to defend that individual. Am I a lawyer and can speak to all of the individual rights that they may or may not have? No, but I do think that there are certain inalienable rights that they would have regardless simply by being a human being. So what you're saying, I want to get it fine tuned because yeah. it's very important. What you're saying then is that that undocumented alien has equal rights as I do as a U.S. citizen as he does as a U.S. citizen. What I'm saying is that we all have equal rights as human beings, and so that's a very different stance than the U.S. Constitution, and that any legal entity that would come in and start beating an individual, there, I might imagine that there would be some type of legal consequence. That's what I'm so in essence, they don't have the legal right. The same legal status, they do not have the same They don't, so they have the right. Now, you know, since you mentioned that, one thing that bothers me, if you bear with me, is in these meetings about this subject, uh, our elected representatives usually say, you can do this, and you can do that, and you can do this, when in fact, the Supreme Court and the federal government back at the president saying, no, you cannot do anything. They even went so far as saying, if that person gets taken out and go to ICE, he does not have the right to an attorney 
in immigration proceedings. I know we have in the Latino community many attorneys getting very rich by telling the immigrant, I can do this and I can do that, knowing feel well they can do nothing, nothing. The other question for you about uh, constitutional rights. I noticed in the meeting yesterday at the council, the last meeting, uh, you objected to two settlements. Uh, settlement is when there's a court case and you pay the person and just go away. You objected to settlements. One was a green case concerning a constitutional violation, and one was an Elks case concerning a constitutional violation. This question is going to go to all three candidates. But for you, why did you object to settling those cases when the other not other eight council members approved it, the city approved it, the police department approved it, the judge approved it, and it ultimately passed over your objection? But I was wondering, sure. why did you object? Sure. So I mentioned earlier that one of the main roles of council is to review all of, we get sued a lot as a city, right, from bus accidents to sidewalks accidents to um, police brutality, et cetera, et cetera. And so ultimately there's a team of attorneys and there's the city departments that review to determine what the money is that they're gonna be paid out, right? So that's more or less how it works. Those cases come to us and we can make a final decision as to whether we think it's a fair and just settlement and whether we think that the city should be um, entering into this agreement or having representation. Uh, I felt that we were in the wrong, that there was excessive use of force within the police department for both of those cases, which is why I objected. I felt the individual um, victims should have received additional funding and they, uh, additional monies, forgive me, um, and uh, be made whole, essentially. And I felt the settlement that we were making is too low because the police brutality that was exhibited in those cases just seemed excessive. And I think in one of the instances, forgive me, I don't have all of the notes, that it, was even, it wasn't dismissed in court. So it, they have grounds for potentially to take it further. In both cases, one case, mm -hmm. uh, the court, they didn't get anywhere, the uh, city just settled it. Mm -hmm. And the other one, they kept up in the court. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. I have one more question. For all three, please be yes or no. Do you know how many people are Detroit being a sanctuary city? I feel it should be a sanctuary city. However, it's, it's out of our jurisdiction. So we, we can request it, we can talk to the mayor about it. I think that he's concerned of losing money if he goes down those lines, but I feel that we should be a sanctuary city. I, I think we need to stop with all this ceremonial stuff. You know, to say you're a sanctuary city and then risk federal monies, or I was reading an article the other day where they say, well, people are going to sanctuary cities and now they're being targeted. It's almost like you're setting people up by drawing them into where they'll be seen and observed. So it, it's one of those things, it sounds good, but is it really good? And we need to get away from this election year, ceremonial talk, and be honest about things we can do and things we can't do. So for clarification, there's no one policy that defines sanctuary city. A lot of the cities that have called themselves sanctuary cities actually still cooperate with the federal government and don't provide sanctuary in the same way. So what we've done at the city of Detroit, whether we use the terminology sanctuary city or not is somewhat irrelevant. We're one of, I think, maybe a handful of cities that actually have a law on the books that prevents anti-profiling. So again, what that means is that the police department, when they pull you over, for example, expired plates or you know your tail light is broken, whatever it is, they cannot and should not be asking you about your immigration status. So although we don't call ourselves a sanctuary city and using that terminology as uh, Mr. Carter mentioned, it's kind of uh, just for media, for show, um, we go beyond in our commitment to protecting immigrants in the city and that we have had for years anti-profiling legislation on the books. And again, while federal immigration raw rules and laws are at the federal level, there are many things that we can do as a local municipality to make sure that everyone feels welcome. And that's, you can see that again in our work on the Immigration Task Force the past four years, um, our, our efforts to join the welcoming movement nationally, our creation of the Office of Immigrant Affairs. You will soon see an announcement that talks about a language access plan. Uh, we were able to get 500,000 500, in the budget to create a comprehensive language access plan, not just for people who don't speak English, but also people who are visually and hearing impaired, to make sure that everyone has access to valuable information and resources. And I'm currently working with the department to hire more people who are multilingual and to have translation services provided. So yes, it's federal 
um, law, but at the same time, there's a lot of things we can do locally. Let me add just one thing. That anti-profiling, it sounds good on paper, but the practice doesn't meet the uh, paper. As a black male, as the father of two sons, you can have all the legislation on the books that you want, but at the end of the day, disproportionately, young black Latino males are still being pulled over for whatever, tinted windows, tags. So you can say anti-profiling all you want to, but does the paperwork meet the practice? And the answer is no. And for clarification, it's the prohibits the police from asking about immigration status. So are, are people of color still pulled over? For sure. And again, those are violations of the law. So if those complaints don't come, it's difficult to follow up. But if you have complaints about an individual officer, please, please let us know because we're trying to strengthen the legislation. I, I have a quick follow-up to the uh, question that you're saying about the uh, sanctuary city possible whatever. Are you saying that the police in Detroit is like the police maybe in San Francisco where they're not allowed to contact immigration or anything like that. Like if they get a criminal who's an illegal alien bring into my house, that's just tough for me. They cannot call immigration and say, hey, I've got this bad actor here. He's illegal. Get him out of our jurisdiction. So you're saying that the police in Detroit, is that, is that what a welcoming resolution no. is? No, what it is is if you, all immigration? if you get pulled over or you're walking out, as they, you can't be asked about your immigration status. If you're in the act of committing a crime, yes, they can ask you about your immigration. If you're committing a felony, you're selling drugs, or you're, I don't know, in the gang, and I don't know what you're doing. But yes, then they can ask about the immigration status. And it, and you, when you're booked, it'll be put in essentially. But a general, the not, so the profiling piece is I'm not gonna just look at you, you look like me as a brown woman and just be like, hey, what's your immigration status? Or your immigration status. It's a little bit different than the actual prohibiting information thing. So, so we don't voluntarily share information. And if immigration comes and requests something, and there's a valid criminal case, then the information will, can be shared. But it's not like we just go and ask which is different. And I'm not that familiar with San Francisco's legislation, so. Isn't that kind of a case where it's that kind of a crime happening where they actually care at that point? Or would they be more, um, would they be more interested in prosecuting them for the crime? I mean, how would Detroit approach that problem? So again, I'm not the police chief, and I know he's come out to talk about this before, and when we, the police commission meeting was held just on the street, he, I think, stated, that the intent is not to ask or pursue undocumented immigrants because it's not our role as a local police department. If there is a, a major felony that's being committed and, it, and they're doing their investigation that comes up as part of that conversation, yes, they're going to use the information, but the intent is never to investigate an individual's immigration status. I and I would refer that for the conversation with the, the chief. I can say this as a person who worked for the Sheriff's Department where most of the arrestees are detained. The Sheriff has said he's not going to notify. However, people need to be aware that when you hear a radio call, the frequency is owned by the state. So other agencies are tuned in. So when you hear a call in a certain area, certain guys just show up out of the blue. Uh, ICE, whoever, you know, whatever it is at this point. So there's really no way to control that and last time I checked, federal law trumps everything else. It does. Yes, a yes or no question for all of the candidates. Um, are you aware, yes or no, are you aware that there is a ordinance in the city of Detroit that requires landlords to, to register their homes and have an annual inspection? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Yeah. What about you? I said yes. I didn't hear you. Okay. Well, why is it that um, landlords are being um, uplifted in the 36th district court and the tenants don't have any resolve whatsoever to see the 10 days or pay your pay your costs. If that landlord, according to the tenants and landlord's book, have a copy for a limited a copy of but the landlord book says if they're not registered with the city of Detroit, they cannot they have no standing in a court of law. It says it in this book. Did you know that? As a landlord, I am aware. And let me tell you where the pilot program started. Started in 48224. And I can tell you personally that they've been ticketing and targeting. I got a $750 ticket for not having lead abatement in a home. The lead inspection was $1,000. Mm -hmm. 
I see it as a money grab. And what they're going to do is run out good landlords who maybe only own two or three houses. Because you don't hear about landlords with 20, 50, 100 properties because they have LLCs and attorneys. So they can tangle it up in court. I think there needs to be a fair process as a landlord for this to happen. Because I'm against slumlords, if you will. But I'm also against people living in your house and not paying you rent based on what they believe. Yeah, and before they move into the house, absolutely. is supposed to take place. Absolutely. And no matter how you feel about it, it is a city ordinance. It is an ordinance. It is a money-making ordinance that can be upheld, and we can make um, a, a substantial amount of money and level that playing field when it gets to the point where we are being sued in the 36th District Court. But if the landlord starts out by not registering that, I think there should be penalties and fines associated with that landlord in the 36th District Court. I realize that the council does not have jurisdiction, but we have an um, engineering and development, development um, department. So I think you guys should look into that. So um, there is a law in the books, as you mentioned, right now we're in the process of updating that legislation and that would actually increase the fines. Um, one of the major problems is that there's not a system in place where the courts actually communicate straight with the city with the building and safety and engineering department. And so the legislation was at the table actually in July. I requested it be brought back in September mm -hmm. because that's one of the main components that's still missing. Right now it's kind of on like an attorney may call the department or vice versa. So tenants aren't up to speed, landlords aren't up to speed, and neither is the city or the courts. So we're trying to create a program similar to, um, I'm forgetting the, the name of the city right now, but where there's an actual special division set up that handles that communication, updates the website so that you would be able to see it in real time as a landlord as well as a resident. So that if you're looking to rent a place, you can see that they don't have their, their inspection or their certificate of occupation. The other piece it would do, uh, it's kind of an enforcement piece that we haven't had enough with inspectors. When the city went into bankruptcy, it cut their inspectors from, let's say, a dozen to about two or three. Last year in the budget, we were able to get additional funding so that now there'll be an inspector per, per district that will be out and doing more of these property inspections. So you should see an improvement. But as Mr. Carter said, we really want to make sure that we support small landlords and really there's an education and outreach component of it and people aren't going to be displaced and renters aren't just going to have crazy high rates to be able to absorb all of the fees. Thank you. Because if I may add this, as a landlord, you don't want your property to sit empty because the furnace, the hot water tank, the pipes, it, it's one of those deals. So I think there needs to be a, a learning curve and a period for a person to be in compliance because the last thing we need is to demolish more homes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. I have a question regarding the uh, warning out grids and the uh, you know, recent fall regarding that. Do you think the residents of the uh, surrounding neighborhoods in this community received enough in this or a fair exchange for uh, that particular deal? And that's a question of all of you. I'll let this move differently. How would, how would you have handled that differently? <laughs> or? So, one of the good things that did happen is that the mayor was able to get over $26 million that went to people that are on the outskirts of the bridge development area. So, that did help a lot of people that originally were not going to get anything. They, I, don't, I don't feel they gave enough to the people that were moved out of their areas. I think they could have done more, but he's still working on it. I have seen some, some of his plans and that additional money that he just got a couple months ago um, was, I think, beneficial for the, the community and the people that were not originally getting anything initially. If, if I may take a stab at that right quick. I was actually one of the original members of the Community Benefits Coalition that beats down in Delray. And I'll tell you right now, they didn't get enough money. They need to be treated like the people in Canada were treated. Remember, they keep saying it's Canadian money. This is not American money. The Canadians are supposedly paying for this, right? So why aren't residents in our city that are being displaced being treated differently than the people in Canada that were displaced? I, I think we need to do a, an examination of how it came about because they let Delray sit for years. If you want to destroy a community, close a the school. They closed Southwestern a bunch of years ago. Look at that neighborhood now. So they're giving these people pennies on the dollar for the ones that are left. And no, it's not fair. So actually, when I was first elected, we created the community advisory group for the ones that were meeting with the Canadians in the state of Michigan and the mayor's office for the past three and a half years. Literally, we met monthly, if not on a, three times a week. 
Um, and so we were actually the group that created the 20 page document with the list of all the community benefits that we were fighting for for that community. Um, and so it was really within the past year and a half that the mayor's team stepped up to help us negotiate with the state of Michigan and, and the Canadians. Um, and so what we, what we talk about oftentimes is that this is the first step in the process. This has been a conversation going on for 15 years nearly, be way before my time. And so while this package isn't complete and there's still some outstanding questions and issues we have to work on, we have some plans in place already to do so. So the total deal is, um, and you can go online and see this as well, but 2.4 for health studies and for air monitoring. As many of you know that live in the district that pollution is a, oh, is, camera, is, a major, is a major issue. So it will bring an additional air monitors into the community to help monitor air quality. And then we'll be able to do a health impact study both before as well as after. And depending on the impact, we may be able to do more. So there'll be like a fun, um, the housing relocation package was 32.6 million. And so, as mentioned before, is that residents who live north of 75 that will be under the ramp or residents who will be outside of the footprint that the state of Michigan were not going to buy out will also have the option of being able to get their homes bought out or potentially to have it retrofitted to uh, reduce uh, pollution as well as noise in, in, in their homes. Uh, an additional 10 million was secured to create jobs for Detroiters from around the city, not just in District 6. And so that funding will go to it. create new job training programs as well as um, uh, I don't know, programs of time. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I am Tushana Gill and I am the founder of United Precinct Delegates. I have to step up here because Dennis Bryant is not good at time. <laughs> we have to be respectful <laughs> of all three candidates. When you respond, pay attention to this lovely lady right here. Because we have so many people back there that have more questions. And then we have to get to the mayoral candidates. So Dennis. <laughs> Treat us like city council. One minute. One minute. Yeah. <laughs> Treat us like city council. Yeah. We had a question. It was it's a young lady back there that's been raising her hand forever. But it seemed like you're already looking right over here. So, yes ma'am, what is your question?
and you can laugh, but I'm crying. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma because, so a little girl was riding her bike furiously down our street a couple summers ago, and my neighbor saw the man in the truck, and he, he said, no one will know, no one will know. Well, she didn't want to get abducted that day. You know, so she wrote furiously. You know, my daughter and her friend, 30, 28 years ago, you know, because we live where we live, and sex is the business. It is. Make no mistake about it. It is the business. <coughs> when the Super Bowl comes in, when big soccer events come in, when baseball comes in, they come to my neighborhood. And nobody represents me. Nobody fights so that I can have a quality of life. And I always say, forgive me of being an ugly looking blight. Yeah. The blight is here. We've got the blight in our heads, yeah. and we're letting this filth continue. Yeah. Yeah. So we a few years ago, voted not to take away the uh, liquor licenses of these bars. They voted for strip joints. Hmm. Yeah. But they didn't vote for my family, for my children, oh. for your children. Mm -hmm. I want to know what you've done in the last couple of years and what you two would do and what you would do um, to address this problem, to really make a dent. I don't want to hear generalities. I want to hear specifics. All right. and you have Where's our <laughs> You got to start a little though. <laughs> you want to go into end? Yeah. So it's between y'all two, whoever want to go first. We have one minute. Go ahead. It's fine. All right. Well, I got to get her attention because I got to give her an answer. Here I am. All right. All right. I will do what I did at the Sheriff's Department. I'm intimately knowledgeable about that area. Yes. And we have shut down those places. What it, it has to get away from being a nuisance to a moneymaker. When I ran the morality unit, we used what we call nuisance abatement and seized cars. We made a half a million dollars. Yes, you did, and you did a good job. Thank you so much. And we need to bring that back because it's a quality of life issue. It is what is allowed. Okay? They allow it on Michigan Avenue. The people on 8 Mile said we're not going to tolerate that anymore. So we, not just as city council, but as community leaders, have to say what we want in our neighborhoods. And it is a moneymaker. The only problem is when you arrest them, the... Young ladies who are usually drug abused only stay in jail for a couple of days. When they do it in Lincoln Park, and I know this to be true, they get the full 30 days. We've got to come up with a system to protect this. And I can do what I did to be successful. We can make money off of it, but we can also stop that from happening because your daughter should not be approached, nor should anybody's daughter, because they want to walk to the store. Any of you other Thank you so much for sharing your story. I have six sisters, um, and I grew up on Park Street, so similar story. I mean, I have sisters who have been raped before. I have sisters who have been victims of domestic violence. And when we walk the streets as I go out door knocking, um, I see the situations that many of these young women find themselves in, and it's very sad and very unfortunate. So I'm sorry I didn't feel that you had to go through that situation. Um, that said, I was a part of Alternatives for Girls for many years. They're a little bit further down, but they actually do quite a bit of outreach services with the young women on the streets, recognizing it's usually a drug problem. Obviously, they can do more. They have limited resources, but it's a really great program to try to get these women out of the system. The other piece is there is actually a human trafficking task force that I didn't set up, but Council President Jones set up, and we've worked closely with Congress of Communities, which has done quite a bit of work around human trafficking and had so, held several workshops with uh, Homeland <coughs> Security, the FBI, Police Department, et cetera, et cetera, simply just to raise awareness around it. And so we hope to continue to expand those efforts because they have focused more in certain areas, but to expand it to Michigan Department as well. May I Next door, she had actually 
before my time. Yes. So this is one of the main reasons that I decided to run. Because we've got all the security downtown, we've got all the cameras, we've got everybody, and right at the corner of my street, nonstop trafficking, nonstop. Mm -hmm. This is a domestic violence problem. We've got a lot of groups that are working individually that we need to pull together, create a task force with those groups, and get stuff done outside of, out in the outskirts of the city. My sister lost her battle to domestic violence. My friend, Elsie Green, stabbed right outside his home. It took 45 minutes for an ambulance to come and he was on the phone with the police the whole time. The outskirts are not getting enough support. They're not getting enough protection. We need to do more and I intend to do more. Outside of all of these uh, duties, the, the role of the city council person in the district should be the chief advocate on behalf of all the residents. Now, we have maybe 15 different communities. They have different needs. Court Town's needs may be different from your neighborhood, but the goal is to intimately know each neighborhood by having meetings in those neighborhoods. You know, it, the charter said that each district should have a community advisory council. I don't see that because this place is too large, too vast, too wide. Your issues are different than Delray's issues. Delray's issues are different than 48217's issues, but they're your issues. And I think as city council, it is my job to address your issues. We got to talk about it because otherwise people aren't leaving because uh, it's a wonderful place. They're leaving because number one, safety. Thank you. So our entire work has been really focused on door knocking and being out in the neighborhoods. I'm the only candidate, I think the only person on council that has visited the neighborhoods on an annual basis. Um, this year alone, we have had visited well over 5,000 homes. I'm the only council person that has a mobile office out in the community specifically to make sure that we see and hear what's going on. It is very physically demanding for me and my staff, but we're true. We're very much concerned with what's happening on the streets, which is why I actually go walk them myself. Um, the other part is that we support the establishment of community advisory councils. My office and my team has actually gone to go get signatures to be able to do that. We've actually been able to negotiate through the budget process, getting more inspectors per district, getting more resources to expand where houses are being demoed, getting more resources to invest in the parks and some of the smaller communities, and getting more resources really for sidewalk repairs, for lights, for our alleys, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have a good track record in doing this over the past three and a half years and hope to continue to do it the next four years. to be 
um, not criminalizing continually the women in the neighborhood. They need help, they need outreach. It's just one of the comments they made, made it sound like, oh, we need to keep them in jail longer. I don't think that's going to fix the problem. They're, um, they're I think, domestically abused. Yeah, it's a domestic and I, and I violence think, um, issue. You know, we need to focus some of the attention on the, um, the people who, who traffic and the people who are the market for this. The guys, or maybe women, I don't know, who are exploiting, um, which tends to be very young women. Yeah. And um, it is very intimate problem to me. I mean, it happens not a block away from where I live. And I just hope that the emphasis is going to be on what will work because we've been doing.
for local um, people inside your community over here in District 6, not downtown, but inside, inside, inside District 6, because with prostitution, that is a form of income coming into the state household. So a large amount of traffic is because of low income coming inside the neighborhood. So we don't need to criminalize any, anybody inside of our communities, but we need to bring economic development inside the communities, not just downtown, but in every last district. And because due to the fact of transportation or insurance rates, we, we cannot, you know, um, handle it on the city council basis or, you know, locally, that state level. Um, but bringing these developments for people inside the community, not outside, because, you know, downtown, majority of the jobs are going to suburbians and, and not citizens of the city of Detroit. So how would you implement these um, plans inside your district, District 6? Who wants to take it first? Yeah. We'll start with that. It's easy. I'm trying to understand the question because District 6 has probably more, more businesses <laughs> pop up here outside of downtown, which is part of District 6 as well. You go along this corridor. What we have, though, in some areas is what's been allowed. There's a strip club. I mean, you don't see them on the other side of uh, Michigan Avenue in Dearborn, do you? Mm -hmm. You don't see them in certain areas. It's what has been allowed and tolerated. You see, you see and, them, but the way they are. Absolutely. The way they present it. You know, the uh, medical marijuana. We have to stop being desperate for new businesses and say, okay, what are we going to bring that is going to improve the quality of life? Because people have been in these communities 30, 40. I've been in my own house 40 years. And I get sick and tired of a guy coming up with a great idea for fast money and going down and, and, and making inroads. We just had a guy try to rezone a building in the community. We're already industrial. At what point does quality of life of residents become a priority? And that is my priority because, again, I live in a house I grew up in, and I'm tired of us being treated like second-class citizens. Thank you. So, it all falls on who's been allowed and who's gotten the approval for these businesses. So, if you look at, I, I tried to get buildings in our neighborhood to start my own business watch them on a regular basis and before you know it someone's already come and bought it <laughs> and it's and it's someone that doesn't live in our neighborhood they know the right people they're not paying attention to the people that live in the neighborhood and giving us the same opportunities that they're giving to the people that are outside of our city just coming here with money for whatever reason they seem to get access and seem to be able to buy stuff where people like us that have been here all these years and we're waiting and looking to buy and purchase stuff for our benefit, for our, the people that live in our community, it, it's not there. So I've complained to the mayor about it, I've complained to the land bank about it with no results whatsoever. I've talked to city council about it, gotten zero responses. So we need to start focusing on giving the opportunities to the people that have lived here, that have been here, so that they have the same opportunities as everyone else that have been coming from the out, outside of our city. Thank you. Um, so in terms of, again, going back to council's role, a lot of times when you attend these forums, you hear people talk about things that council really doesn't have authority to do, or maybe has limited authority. So in terms of our role as it relates to economic development, some of the things that we talked about are the $10 million that we secured for job training, right? And that's going to be going into centers like Randolph, as well as to hopefully supporting programs like Mass for Us, as well as the Motor City Match program, which those are programs designed specifically for Detroit entrepreneurs to either get them into retail space or to help them create their business plan and then access loans and funding so that they can actually start their business in the neighborhoods. Um, so that's a prime example of one. The other thing is working with uh, developers as they come in to make sure that some of the retail space they're creating is also subsidized for nonprofits and entrepreneurs. And that on every single deal, there's a certain percentage of jobs going for, for entrepreneurs or supporting small contractors. And that's through kind of having them work with larger contractors so that they can have jobs and that there's sparking development in their neighborhoods. We have time for one last, one last question. We have time for a couple more questions. Any more questions? Yeah, questions. Yeah, district. I had a, um, it's different from other districts. So if you have any more questions, one of them will be your city council rep. 
Go ahead. I have a, okay, the question I had is oh, okay. right here on Grand Boulevard, um, you know where the Grand Locks are, and then we have all those abandoned buildings right next to it. So I, I'm not sure if Boydell bought those <coughs> properties or if those properties are going to be up for sale or like what's happening with those properties in terms of development. So they've just been sitting there for years now. I stay right there in the Grand Locks, and those, those properties are just sitting there. So do the city have some sort of control over them, or what's going on with those properties? Who wants to go first? That is a great question of I don't know. I'm not going to sit here and, you know, give you some long, drawn-out answer. I have to find out for you. Then we'll proceed, because if I owned that building in my neighborhood, it couldn't just sit there. Yeah, I mean, the, the Grand Loft building itself, they, they started it in um, 2008. Mm -hmm. We only got three floors of it developed. The other two are not developed yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. But all those abandoned buildings that sit next to them are just been sitting there. So I'm always curious, like, okay, are they still, are they complete, are they safe with the city, or what's going on? Sure. Yeah. Sure. So um, I'll actually be at the Grand Walks this Saturday with some people. So um, as it relates to the buildings, I think most of them are commercial structures. Offhand, I don't know who owns the property, but in general, if there's any building that's like open or has garbage or has trees, you can always call. We can figure out who owns it, and then from there, usually if it's a commercial structure like that, then the building and safety department we can request that they go out and they do an inspection, and then. Once we determine who the property owner is, either they'll be fined or they'll come out and be required to clean up their property. Um, I just, in terms of who the owner is, I don't know offhand, but it's something that we can look into for sure. Okay. Um, is there any more questions? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I have uh, one more question, one last question. Um, well, really two questions, not related. One, uh, gentrification. It's you know, big downtown, mm -hmm. um, big. And the trickling down into the southwest track community, I feel, and um, I know you know uh, people that reside within this community. Um, basically, I don't want to see residents that have been in fear for a long time forced out of their, uh, out of, you know, prices of rent rate high or increasing, prices of housing increasing. What are your uh, thoughts on that, and uh, to what extent uh, is council uh, will you advocate or ensure that? Uh, residents don't lose their communities. And, and our, we, as, as a culture, we don't lose our community. Mm -hmm. That's one. That's okay. one question. And then you go. So, right now, what they have noted as far as planning development and construction that's going on is that 20% of that is reserved for low income housing. That's that's way too low. That's pushing 80% of us out. That's giving more property to people with higher income. 20% is nothing. That's, that's way too low. Uh, we need to push back on that. I've seen some development plans um, in this area actually, where they've got four focus groups that they're gonna be building, um, that they're they brought to the table as a proposal, all in this neighborhood. I think we need to focus more of our time on the outskirts, still 48210, 48217, 48204, have gotten very little focus on those neighborhoods. And when they do, they need to make the percentage much higher than 20% for low income housing. So um, for the state will not allow us to regulate rental rates, unfortunately, um, but I have been an avid advocate of inclusionary housing, which is a law that will uh, be introduced in the next couple months. And so what that requires is 20% of affordable housing at different tiers. And I won't explain too much that what that means, but it, it's at different tiers of the annual, the average median income, which is 30, most Detroiters are between 30 and 50%. So basically, whereas 20% of the units, if let's say there's a building that has 100 units, 20% of those would be considered affordable. The low income housing is different. Uh, it's usually lower than the 80%. But that said, basically, we've been a strong proponent of affordable housing um, within units. It's different than when it's housing, how individual houses. You can't necessarily have it the same way when it's houses in a neighborhood versus apartments in a building. But we've supported since the beginning and continue to support affordable housing 
in buildings as well as in communities, as well as affordable space for um, local entrepreneurs, because that's also an issue as it relates to uh, gentrification. To your question of about gentrification, it's come and gone. The areas that they wanted, they've got, and they got them two ways. If you remember a few years ago, there used to be a place called Cass Quarter. Remember that place? Mm -hmm. It's now called Midtown, correct? Yeah. Yeah. You can't even talk about Cass Quarter. Mm. The other thing is, a lot of these neighborhoods, people were drawn out of their homes because of the ridiculous tax assessments that were put on these homes after the collapse. Most of the people who lost their homes through the tax auction, now, this year, the city has rolled back everybody's taxes, correct? Yeah. Well, it's a little too late for the people that have lost their homes. And I can tell you personally, I've bought a few homes in my neighborhood for less than $1,000 because of those taxes. We were not putting people in their homes by giving them the opportunity because it was cheaper to allow other people to come in. They didn't come in my neighborhood. That's why I was able to get these houses at a lower price. The gentrification piece is come and gone. As far as affordable housing, <coughs> it's based on what and who. When you go downtown on Lafayette near Orleans, that place didn't exist two years ago. And I guarantee you, most Detroiters will not be able to pay to live in it. Sorry, uh, last and final question for myself. Returning citizens, uh, there's a lot of young men and women who have made mistakes in the early years and uh, you know, are looking for an opportunity to become productive members of the community. What is your position on that? What is your uh, stance on providing resources for them so that they may do that efficiently uh, if you were elected and you've been elected this way? Sure. So in the past, my office has helped host expungement workshops. And so what that means is that people who have a felony can come in, depending on a felony, and get their record clean as a way to help them clean up their record. And we've done that for free. Um, as it relates to resources, we helped create the Detroit ID card specifically because a lot of people returning from the prison system don't have valid IDs and can't access services because they don't have an ID card. So this ID card, they can get a little bit easier and then use it as a use it applying for jobs, use it you know, looking for housing, things like that. And then in addition, on all of the contracts that we get with the city, we make sure that that, that com company doesn't have a question about people's criminal records to make sure that, that they aren't gonna be denied a job because of their criminal record. And in addition to that, we um, work with uh, the job placement entities, Detroit Employment Solutions, and other nonprofits to help put these individuals in the pipeline for different jobs. Thank you. Oh, no, you're good. You have three seconds. As a person who watched people that I grew up with leave while I'm working in a jail and go off for 10, 15 years, first of all, when they come back, I think they have to have the right attitude because there are people out here who've never done anything that are having a hard time getting jobs. So we, we have to be honest and open about the attitude of some of the people coming back. Yeah, I did my time. I did these things. Some people are forgiving. Some aren't. I can tell you personally. In my security company, I will hire them. You know why? I understand that most of the guys that come back, they're really hungry. They're really, they have a work ethic. Because a lot of young guys don't have work ethics, and it's not their fault. Returning citizens need to be treated as citizens. Okay, and they need to understand that, you know what? It's tough out here for everybody. But if you're willing to work hard, then we'll make opportunities for you. You know, I get upset when people say, well, you know, the guy did his time. I understand that. He harmed some people. He paid his debt. But at the end of the day, I know some guys have never done anything are having a hard time making ends meet as well. Thank you. So I spend a lot of time working with small to mid-sized businesses. And the one thing that I focused on when I worked with them and helping them grow their business is not to have that question on their application. That's what we need more across the board I want to focus on a lot of companies here in District 6, help them grow their business, look at their bottom line, what's your break-even point, and then have them hire people that can't normally get jobs with these larger corporations. That being people that are returning citizens. They need it more than anything because they've served their time, they've done their time, they deserve to get back to work so that they don't get back in the same predicament just to get food on the table. So I plan to focus
focus on that, helping the businesses grow and making sure that they focus on when they do grow, hiring people that are returning and people that need it the most. Okay, each you all have a one minute closing statement. Because he 
did throw something out there. And so if anybody wants to respond to that, it's one minute. Okay, quickly. A police chief understands that the life expectancy of a police chief is 3.6 years. You know why? An election is every four years. The easiest way to act like you're attacking crime is to get rid of your chief. Bottom line is, we have to get away from being politically correct and do what the people in the neighborhoods want. I live in the neighborhood where I see guys riding their bikes across on the phone, get their dope, and go back to the other side of Otter Drive. We gotta be honest about our intent. And, and that's not just my, her neighborhood. All of them are the same. We have to address this crime issue, this safety issue, otherwise people are gonna continue to move out. Stop coming on TV saying crime is down 10%. That means nothing to me if my house has been broken into. Because me reporting crime and me telling it to my insurance company is two different things. People have to be honest about our communities. Crime and safety is an issue and we need to address that first. Um. <laughs> Correct. First step, let the police do their job, get them off the street. Second step, there are a lot of organizations that have saved a lot of people that have pulled a lot of the people that are being abused off these streets, getting them help, getting results, pull, taking those organizations, look at the results that they have had, putting them together is a key as well to keep the streets clean after the police have done their job, to maintain and to educate our girls, our guys, whomever it may be, to not let it continue and to make our streets safer that way. Um, so agree wholeheartedly that crime and safety are major issues. Just on Sunday, there was a man sitting out in my house watching me and my sisters come in and out of the house and we pretending he was in a wheelchair and that was really scary for us. That said, it's, there's not shackles on the police. Simply, we are losing so many officers because people are older and aging out and we cannot recruit enough people to replace it. So we are short dozens of officers on the streets because we simply don't have enough. So to say that, to take the shackles off is one component, but it's not really, the, the challenge is that we just don't have enough officers. And I think we have an understanding of how the system works and what to support to provide to DPD. Um, but some of the other, I think, responses don't really reflect the reality. We need more people to apply to become an officer in the city. And when we're able to actually meet the goal of what we have, then we'll be able to do a better job of patrolling our communities. But in the meantime, we partner with groups like Liz Valdez right here, who runs a safety patrol in her community. There's a safety hub down the street, and there's others that we've been working with groups to try to create. Okay, let's do the three questions real quick.
to let people know about the Detroit ID Park. Um, what they're shifting from is rather than just being at Patton Park and at the Samaritan Center on the east side, is to doing more pop-up locations, so going to churches, going to schools, going to nonprofits, going to block club meetings to let people know about it, and that's something new that has started in the last couple of months. So if you have a program or something that you would like us to come or the Detroit ID program to come to so they can either get people signed up for an appointment or pass out information, please let us know. And then I have a team of 20 young people that work with me each summer around leadership and things, and they're also distributing information to let people know. It's just slowly. But we've had multiple people sign up, thousands of people sign up, actually. Okay, let's do Edward, and then let me go ahead and see you Okay, I have a question. I guess I want to piggyback on that. So we talked about sweeping the neighborhoods, right? We get all the prostitutes, we lock them up. We get all the drug dealers, we lock them up. I mean, because this is what this is what's being said. It's lock them up, and then where they go? Then what you do when you lock them up? I love what this man said about empowering the people and getting involved. That's how it was growing up. The neighborhoods took care of the neighborhoods. These prostitutes are lost individuals. Fathers not in the home. Mothers not there. I run a nonprofit. I deal with thousands of youth yearly. I know about these households with these broken families are in. So where I love what you said. I believe in that. Some program, some education has to be somebody. We grab them up. We don't lock them up. We grab them up. We love on them. We teach them. We show them we care. And then they won't run to the strip joints. But they won't run to try to sell it. But they're looking for money, love, and attention. And, that, and that's what they're looking for. We are the people that provide that love and attention to them. We are the we are the community. When you lock them up, who gonna pay for them? Who gonna pay? Who, who pays for the prisoners? Who? That's taxpayer dollars. We can't the, lock them up. Don't solve the problem because there's also a release there. And when they're released, they go right back to what they know. We gotta be the ones that empower them love on them and teach them. So what, is that the only solution? Lock them up? That's my question. Or do we follow what this young lady was saying and this young man was saying about being the community to get involved and empower people? I'm sorry. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You know, that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> take a stab at it. First of all, we, we have to look at how did this happen. Do a root cause analysis. We talk about the way things used to be. Well, used to bees don't make honey. Bees make honey. We can talk about yesteryear all we want to. But the bottom line is we've taken everything away from the schools. We've taken everything away from the homes. We have a bunch of people out here who are nomads. And it's probably cheaper to put them in jail in some people's eyes than it is to fix them when they're broken and they're young. You cannot lock up this problem. So, but there has to be punishment, there has to be consequences, and we have to talk about that early. When we lock some of the young ladies up when I worked at the jail, you have them for 30 days. You can detox them, you can send them to programs, but they have to want to go. We can't want things for people that they don't want for themselves. Yeah. You know, we can work as hard as we want to. I'm a mentor. All summer long, I've got 40 to 60 young men. We go around boarding up houses. I lose two a week. 
because they're products of their environment. No matter how much I fight to save them, I can't beat what's at home or what they've been taught. So I'm a social worker by trade. I have my bachelor's and master's in social work, and I was born and raised in the city, and I grew up in poverty, and many of the young girls that I went to alternatives for girls with, maybe didn't make it per se, whether they got married, or married, married whether they got pregnant and dropped out of school, or, or just didn't have the same opportunities per se, and so I think you have to have a holistic approach, um, and not necessarily just locking people up, but recognizing that there's a lack of support and needs, and so I very much come from the framework of supporting restorative justice, recognizing that our, we have a, a school to prison pipeline, recognizing that our communities aren't safe, but oftentimes there are some of the young people that need the greatest amount of support. And so it can't just be prison and it can't just be supportive services, that it has to be a combination of the two of providing wraparound services, really looking at the causes, but also ultimately holding people responsible. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna stand by what I've said the last couple of times. We've got a lot of organizations that have gotten a lot of results helping people that have been stuck in this circle pulling people out of it, saving their lives. And there's all over the place. If we can pull people from each of those organizations, first look at their statistics, look at what their results have been, pull people from each of those organizations, I think those are gonna be the ones that are gonna help us the most because they've been doing it for years. They've been doing it for years and they have a lot of good results. We're not gonna have the answers to this. But if we reach out to the people that have been doing it all this time, they're gonna be able to help us the most. And then if you take all of them and pull them together, I think we could make a significant impact on that problem. Any more questions? Oh yeah, I have one quick question. Oh, she has a question. Who are you, man? What is your my, name? My, my name is Artesia Bomber, and I am running for the office of mayor, so we can handle all these issues. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's a great question. 
the uh, ID program. Good to see you out here today. Uh, that's a great question. My name is Al Williams. I see you have a question real quick. Uh, pardon me? My name is Al Williams. I'm uh, one of the United, I'm, I'm a member of the United Precinct Delegates. I've, I've moderated a few of these forums in the past around the state. I mean, around, around, the, around, the, around the city, and then we've done some things around trainings around the state. And so, I'm sorry I'm late, but I want to I want to sort of piggyback on that question. I know you might have a question, but there is uh, there are a few people in the room that might be able to follow up and give an answer on that question. When I think of the municipal ID, there's a verse to me that comes to mind. And I, I listen to hip hop. And there was a guy named Mos Def who wrote a song called Questions. And part of his song said, um, why do I need ID to get ID? And if I had ID, <laughs> and if I had ID, why would I need ID? In the state of Michigan, you need identification to go get state ID, right? And so there are a lot of issues surrounding people not being able to get access to that ID. I got a good friend here by the name of Brandon Snyder who's done a lot of work with uh, Detroit Action Commonwealth in helping to provide ID and access to ID to individuals who cannot afford to purchase an ID at the Secretary of State time at the Secretary of State's office. I just came from a forum where there was a question about state IDs. And so that's a great, great question. And um, you know, if you had a follow-up question on that. Do you have a question? Go ahead. So my question is, um, so there was a guy on the corner that I saw so many multiple times. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes I talk to these things because he can't answer. And you know, I asked this one guy, I said, um, so why do we look? You know? And um, you know, he said, well, you know, I, I can't get a job or something. I don't know what he said. I said, he said, you know, I need an ID to get a job. Now this is an American citizen. Um, and um, so evidently he was born in a country state and um, and he's here and he's very comfortable with him and because um, and so he went to the local um, Michigan Political Leadership Program. 
I'm a resident 40 years. If I were to use three words to sum me up, number one would be consistency. I've been married to the same woman 22 years. I worked the same job for 25 years. I've lived in the same household for 40 years. Number two is service. I serve the Sheriff's Department. I work at Wayne County Community College. I'm the president of my neighborhood organization. And the last is advocacy. When I was a young officer, we were making $6.99 an hour at the Sheriff's Department. I figured out a way to get in the game, and it's through advocacy. I ended up being the chief union steward of my division. Then I ended up being the vice president, you know, negotiating for everybody. There's a saying that what a person has done will give you an idea of what they will do. Everywhere I've been has been successful. And the last but not least, for the last three years, I've been at Wayne State with AmeriCorps. We boarded up more houses than the city of Detroit. And they say that imitation is the best form of flattery. Well, all of a sudden, election year, the city has their own board up team. Well, you can thank AmeriCorps for that. So if you're talking about success, not about getting things done, but about things being done. Last but not least, I just got $2 million to open up a rec center that's been closed because of my advocacy. And finally, if it were not for this advocacy, it took me an hour and a half to get home. I-75 has always been a blast, but I live separated by the river. If Detroit can't get to us, my people aren't safe. So it's about advocacy. Tyrone Carter, District 6, City Council. Thank, Thank you. you. Felicia Telugo, City Council District 6, Lugo for Detroit.com. I was born and raised in Detroit as well. I am also a product of Detroit Public Schools. Had a very large family growing up. My mom had 10 children. I know what it's like to struggle. I know what it's like to be on the streets without a place to stay. I have lived the struggles that the people in our community have lived. I have worked with uh, nonprofit organizations since the age of 10. I spent over 20 years after I graduated from college working with youth in our community, helping them get scholarships for college, helping them go to school so that they don't get stuck in the same predicament. My organization has raised over a million dollars in scholarships doing just that for students wanting to go back to school. I volunteered for the accounting AIDS Society since the 90s. I have been in so many organizations, I, I've tried to list them all and I, I don't even have the full list, but Girl Scouts, Foster Care Alumni Association, helping kids that are aging out of the foster care system that don't have anywhere to go. Paquette Square, which is homeless veterans, Gleaners Food Bank, Focus Hope, Habitat for Humanity, Women in Action, Toys for Tots, La Said Senior Center. That's just half of them. But I say this to say that I've been in our community for decades. This is not new to me. I'm not doing this to run for political office. I take, I'm taking a significant pay cut if I end up serving you as your district council representative. So it's not about me. If it was about me, I would stay in my cushy job at Ford Motor Company, collect my pay, and call it a day. But I've seen what's been going on. I've seen how our neighborhoods have been ignored. And I want to do as much as I can to help the people in our community that have been ignored for the past few years. Time. Councilwoman Lopez. Thank you. My name is Raquel Castaneda Lopez, the longest one you'll see on the ballot. And for the past three and a half years, I've had the honor to represent District 6. All of District 6 from downtown to 48217 to the Midwest community in 48204 to the Forgotten Communities in 48208. Um, I have the op I'm the only one on the ballot that actually has experience and understanding of what the role of council should actually be doing. And while a lot of the other experience in other sectors may be helpful, it doesn't necessarily mean you understand how the budget process works, how committees work, um, how services, constituent services work, and really how to get the work done. So we have a proven track record of providing services to over hundreds of residents from water affordability to foreclosure prevention to citizenship support. Um, and we've worked, again, for the past couple years to fight for community benefits, which is why we were able to get close to $75 million for the Delray community and the Southwest Detroit community as a whole. Again, I have a proven track record from my mobile office that goes out from school to school to my youth that work with me in the summer to go door knocking to make sure that we understand and we see and what we hear what's going on in every single neighborhood. And that's why I'm running for re-election, 
because we have a lot of work still to do. Um, but even the other, my colleagues recognize that we are the hardest working office and we're the only ones that are out on an annual basis making sure that we're reaching neighborhoods. And so I hope I can count on your support. Again, Raquel Castaneda Lopez, the longest name on the ballot. And if there's anything we can do in the interim, please, please let me know. All right. chose to live in District 6 and raise my children in District 6. I served the city and, in fact, went to, wanted to implement programs to help residents of this district in addition to the entire city. That municipal ID program that we talked about a few minutes ago, I'm proud to have worked to implement that program. That idea is an enabling force for members of our community, for people who are returning home from jail, for people who are otherwise undocumented immigrants. This idea is an invitation to participate in society, and I'm proud to have worked on that because it's an enabling force. I'm also proud to have fixed broken systems around the city of Detroit. In District 6, we have thousands of fire hydrants that don't work, or that didn't work. But I implemented a program working with the fire department and the water department to fix those fire hydrants so the firefighters will be able to do their job to inspect them, and the water department will be able to do their job to fix them. So that means if there's a fire, and there are a lot of fires in District 6, when they get to your block, 
instead of hooking up to a hydrogen water in it, they save your house. And they save your neighbor's house. And they save your dog. And they make sure that you, yourself, also can survive that fight. I've been solving problems for city government in this, in this community and all across the city. That's exactly what we need in the city clerk's office, somebody that can fix broken systems. I went to vote last year with my entire family, my wife and my three-year-old twin babies. And an hour and a half later, at 7 o'clock, 7.15 in the morning, my voting machine broke, ran out of paper, ran out of pens, ran out of green privacy screens. Mm -hmm. And then when we tried to do a recount, we found that three out of every five polling places had ballots that couldn't be counted right. That's because the process was broken. My grandma told me that if a process is broken, if the system needs fixing, you hire an engineer to fix it. I got two engineering degrees from the University of Michigan. I used to work with Microsoft after college, fixing systems and solving problems for people all across the country. But I've also been a fighter and advocate for voters all across the country as well, protecting and expanding people's rights. We need somebody who's a fighter and a winner in the city clerk's office, someone who can fix systems, solve problems, but also fight for our community. We haven't gotten that from that office. That's what you get if you elect Garland Gilbert as your next city clerk. So thank you, District 6, for having me at this forum. Check me out at gilchrist for cityclerk.com. That's G I L C H R I S T for cityclerk.com. Thank you. All right, all right, all right. We're going to uh, bring, uh, we have the mayoral candidates here, three of them. Um, and I'm going to have them do, what are you doing? Two minutes? Yep. Two minutes. Okay, we're going to deal with the uh, mayoral candidates. Two minute introductions, starting with the young lady here in the middle. Just go ahead and um, all right. have it. All right. All right, hello everybody, and thank you for the people who stay. I'm so happy to see you still here. Well, for my introduction, I'm going to read what's on my flyer. There you I'm go. Gonna, and um, who is Artesia Bowman? That's what you all want to know. A mayoral candidate whose name will appear at the very top of your voters' ballot. Artesia Palmer has the perfect plan for Detroit, but cannot execute that perfect plan without your vote. If Artesia Palmer is not elected, Detroit loses out on what could be the most epic election in the year of Detroit's history. Artesia Palmer will give Detroiters a voice like never before. Artesia Palmer will combat crime like never before. Artesia Palmer will make sure our city of Detroit looks better than ever before. Artesia Bomer has no experience of being a mayor, but what she does have is 35 plus years of experience living in the city of Detroit. She knows what it's like to live in a critical time of failed proven leadership, who have tried, but now has, now has turned the city around back to its original state. Artesia Bomer can and will turn this city around back to its original state. Artesia Bomer can reinvent Detroit's blueprint. Artesia Bomer is for equality. She will make sure that Detroit is open and fair to the inner communities as well. Detroit has had many men mayors, but there has never been a woman elected as mayor of Detroit ever. Let's change this stigma in Detroit. Let us give Artesia Bomer a chance to prove that women can be great leaders as well. You are my employers, Detroit. I am applying for the open position as mayor. I am an inventor. If hired by Detroit, I will create a mass amount of jobs so that Detroiters are hired as well. Remember, Detroit, please vote for Artesia Bomer on August 8, 2017 at the primary elections. And I also want to state that I am running a nonpartisan, come one, come all, mayoral candidacy campaign. And I will stay nonpartisan throughout my term. If you vote me in five times, I will stay nonpartisan. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. How y'all feel? I know y'all feeling kind of sleepy from that uh, city council thing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> no, we not. Okay. Uh, my name is Curtis Christopher Green, and uh, I'm gonna go into why why I'm running. I'm running because the people that I know have lost sweet hope. I come from the Destin Linwood area. I'm not from this district. I'm actually from District 5. And that's why I stay now on the east side. I don't stay in the Destin Linwood area anymore. And uh, I created a seven point plan to rebuild Detroit. You can find it on my, my Facebook, Curtis Christopher Green, Silent E on the end of Green. 
and also at my uh, my YouTube page at Reverend Curtis Christopher Green. I'm also ordained minister, been ordained minister for four years. And uh, I have something called the Halo Incentive. That's for uh, people who are returning back to the community that have been in, in prison. If they have earned degrees like myself, but now I have non doctoral credit to organization leadership management, master in marketing, and bachelor's in marketing. And uh, yet and still, I go to the private sector. I put in my application, and uh, I have the education to get the job. And, and they will give it to somebody who father knew somebody before me just because of my history. And it's not fair, and it's, continu it's a continual process. And I'm going to be the one that be a catalyst behind this thing. I mean, you can't just jail everybody and, and throw, throw away the key. Now, I'm not all about singing kumbaya with everybody either. I will crank that whip, and I do have a, a bit of fire behind me. I'm much more fire than I am smoke, and I'm no nonsense type of guy. You know, but that's for a reason. I grew up on Dexter, where it was really rough. I mean, if you weren't from that area, you couldn't come there if you didn't know somebody in the area, in the area I grew up in. I'm approximately 33 years old. And it was really rough. It's still rough over there now, but it's nothing like how it used to be. But I understand and overstand, I mean, I know all about why these people are in those conditions. Once you deprive somebody of love and hope and opportunity, they have, their, their uh, animalistic behavior will, will, will just emerges out of people. And they react like savages because they feel like they have no reason to be so. I myself am a reformed thug, and I come from finished with the script program. And so I understand the condition as to why people are doing what they're doing in the city of Detroit. And I have solutions in my seven point plan of the city that you can check out on my Facebook page. And that's my time. Stay forward. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening District Six. Uh, my name is Edward Dean and I am running from Mary Detroit. I am a single father raising a teenage daughter. I'm also an educator. I teach K-8 over at George Crocker Catholic Access. Uh, I'm also uh, a minister, a youth minister. I preach um, to the youth every Friday um, over um, on Grace Church of the Nazarene on the east side of Detroit. And I live over in the 48205 zip code, one of the worst zip codes in the country. Right? I'm running to be your next mayor. I'm also the CEO and founder of a successful nonprofit organization here in the city of Detroit that mentors young men and women to teach them how to sustain the world that we live in today, teach them entrepreneurship training, and also politics training. I'm running to be your next, that's why I'm running to be your next mayor, because I've taught in the school system. I still teach in the school system. I live in a real bad neighborhood, and I also work with a lot of youth and a lot of parents. I hear the brokenness in the city. I hear the cries of the people, and I see the preferential treatment between those that's wealthy and those that's not wealthy. The favor is being given to those that's wealthy and not. There's a lack of hope in the city of Detroit, and I'm running to instill the hope back in the people and show them how that they can live in a city where everybody is on the same level playing field and no one else is being treated fairly other than, up, than others. That's why I'm running to be the next mayor. I see what's going on in the city of Detroit. I understand the needs of the people. I'm running to make sure that the level, the plan field is level and more houses is ready for the people. My, my plan is economic development, crime reduction, and accessible housing. If you'd like me to be your next mayor, those are the things I'm going to put a lot of emphasis on and make sure that our city is great again as it is for us. Thank you for your time.
Um, and that wasn't a special price. That was a few years ago. So I know they don't cost that much. So, um, so why wouldn't the city clerk want to give them a, an ID that's good throughout the state, that's a real ID, um, and would give them this little city ID um, that they can't vote with, they can't you know, drive with, they can't do anything with. Okay, um, I want to I want to answer that question. Um, when we worked on the task force for the municipal ID, I worked on it from an immigration standpoint because you had a lot of people that came in that were unable to get IDs. They were now, undocumented. Undocumented. Now, Detroit is not the first city to implement a municipal ID. You have Las Vegas, you have New York, you have DC, you have Chicago. I, you know, I, 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 I was asking about people who were coming out of prison. Oh, I don't no, know by. Uh, no, I'm just saying, no, but the, yeah. the, the municipal ID are for people that are coming out of prison, but it's also for undocumented immigrants. Um, and it's also for homeless people. You Just last week, I had a homeless guy come to me to ask me to help him go get an ID. We went to the, we went to the, um, the Secretary of State. There are certain things that you need in order right. to get a state ID. Right. That gentleman did not have that. He didn't have a birth certificate because he wasn't born here in Michigan. He didn't have um, the certain things that he needed. We went to the Social Security office. He couldn't get a social security card because he didn't have a state ID, okay? Mm -hmm. So there are people that are caught in the system that don't have access to getting a state ID and that Detroit Municipal ID helps those in that arena. Okay, time's up. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gilchrist, your answer to her, her question? So the question was, uh, why, the city, why should the city clerk help you get a municipal ID versus a different form of ID? Versus a state question? ID, yes. Yeah, so, you know, there are significant barriers that I think have been articulated to people getting ID. I think that, you know, frankly, I don't think there's, I don't think it's an argument that having ID is an enabling force in people's lives. It can enable you to do things like start a bank account. It can enable you to do things like um, be able to have a potentially less life-threatening interaction with the police. I mean, having ID is something that's very important. And I think the city of Detroit making a choice to serve Detroiters who otherwise would not serve by state ID is an example of the type of things and problems that Detroit public officials should be solving for its residents. And so I think by um, by enabling people to have a form of ID when they are not eligible for others, I think is a great starting point. Now certainly, I think if people are able to you know acquire the resources that they need to get other forms of ID, this is not prohibiting them from doing so. But I want people to have a chance to participate fully in society. And I think one of the ways that we can help do that is by having by enabling them to participate in the municipal ID program. So, Any other questions for our clerk candidate? Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, I want to follow up on that. So $200,000 was spent on this program. And um, I know from talking to that one homeless person that um, you know his, his birth certificate is in another state. Um, and so I really come back to that. Why can't we help them get the right ID? Yes. So, so that so why so why so if you're going to go through all this trouble and this time and this money, why can't we do it the right way for some people who can get that? I don't think it's wrong. I mean, let me let me no, say no, that. No, but so. I'm saying oh, the no, right no, way no, for no, people no. who can get. It. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I don't. I don't. I don't think it's wrong. And I think yes, it, it makes sense to have to help someone get ID or whatever ID makes sense. Sure. And if an ID that is accessible to them because for whatever reason that person can't afford to get his birth certificate from some states that cost twenty five, fifty dollars to get your ID. I tried to do I mean get your birth certificate. And we spent two hundred thousand dollars on this program. Yeah. I'm talking but that guy doesn't have two hundred thousand dollars. So I'm talking about like my grandmother, for example, who had to, who was participating in a program such as this and who could not get her birth certificate from another state, the state of Alabama to be specific. And so when we have people who have barriers to getting other types of things, we need to do things to help them participate. I think helping them by a program that we implemented that serves Detroiters directly and also participate in our, in our processes in our society, I think is something that so we should So I guess should. I want to know why they can't get one from Alabama. Okay, well, come on. Yeah, I mean. But you can go there. Everybody can't just get up and go there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 don't go there. 
as your city clerk, I'm going to serve you. And that means I want to make sure that you have ID that you can get access to if, that's the, if you so choose to do that. And so I don't, I don't want to discriminate against people because of that situation that they may exist in their life. I think it's important for us to provide services to the residents of people in Detroit. That includes giving people an enabling ID um, to participate in the site. And, and I, I think that's important. Now, if people who are eligible for other forms of identification, they are eligible for that, and they have the means to get those, but that's a very big and. There are a lot of people, my family members, who do not have the means to acquire other forms of identification. I do not want to turn them away from participating in, in parts of our society because they do not have the means. The Detroit Municipal ID Program was meant to enable them and, and help them participate. She wants, to, she wants to respond to your question, sir. Then yeah, I just want you to know that the, the, the when I worked on the task force for this program as well, um, it's not it's to help those that are not able to get an ID right on hand. So even though you get a Detroit Municipal ID, you can still be provided the resources to get a state ID or even a passport. But the Detroit Municipal ID program was specifically for those homeless people, for returning citizens, and for an undocumented. Um, immigrants and also just for everyday Detroit. I mean, I have a passport, I have a state ID, but I still went and got a municipal ID because you it's just it's just it's for a residential program here in the city of Detroit. And I think that program was very important. We just had um, four years ago somebody very close to me was deported. They they passed away on Monday. They were deported back to Senegal. Why? Because they didn't have any ID when they were here in the city of Detroit. So when they got caught with their passport, they ended up getting put back into the system and getting deported. And when they got back to their country, they wasn't able to get the medical services that they would have received here. But they lived and worked here for 17 years. You understand? So there, there are communities that are affected by this, that this yeah. municipal ID program to really help. Uh, I, I have to follow with her Good evening. My name is Tanya Wells. I am precinct delegate in um, 405 district. Uh, that is also the seven uh, city council question. My question is very short to all of the candidates. What are the job descriptions of your particular race that you're running? to serve and protect the whole city of Detroit. 
this mayor's job will to be will be to get accountability for everybody under the Bomber administration. That means for the city clerks, the city council, everybody. I want to make sure everybody is doing their job correctly, and I will have time to do that because all I have time is to do is love my city of Detroit. As far as these landlords, stiffer penalties need to come down on the building and maintenance department first because I know for a fact that uh, complaints have went into the building maintenance department. They come out, they inspect this rental property. They don't show back up. There's no um, uh, uh, repeat uh, visit. Um, and you have them down there, they're working deals with landlords. I believe they're it's so corrupt that they're taking payments from the landlords. Um, they have even advised landlords to evict if they don't, can't fix a, a hazardous issue. Or should I say evict? If you don't like that tenant, just evict them for complaining and then get another tenant in there with the same issues going on. Um, um, far as um, penalty, penalty wise, there is no such thing as a building maintenance department that come out and ask you what kind of race is your landlord. That's, that, that, that showed me right there that you're going to discriminate against the tenant. Thank you. That's my question. So uh, the job of the mayor, he is the executive director of the city of Detroit. He makes sure that all of the needs of the people are met. He works with the people. He engages with the people. And he is the voice for the people. Uh, the mayor of Detroit may, um, do, do those things by way of um, involving with the people and building the budget for the city council to approve to make sure these things come to, to fruition that the people want. As far as the slum of uh, the landlords is not following <laughs> up what they supposed to do, uh, I agree with Ms. Bomber's stricter penalties, fines, and make sure that we follow up on these inspections and make sure they're done. Uh, and, and if they're not done, they need to be fined. They need to be fined. And, and, and that, those are the things that need to be done. I know you wanted to be brief. We have more people to answer, uh, to ask questions, so that's my answer. Okay. You're about to leave. You want to answer a question? Yeah, um, well, the, the clerk's office operates on three levels. Um, first and foremost, they, they handle the elections for the city. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, the clerk's office operates on three levels with the city. First and foremost, they handle the elections department. Um, they also are the liaison between the residents of the city and the city council and city government, basically. Um, and then third and foremost, they handle um, licensing or like documentation, marriage, divorce, <coughs> state of clerk, they're basically like the secretary for the state. So that's um, what the clerk's office do. Now in terms of the um, home landlords um, being able to to document what, what they're doing or whatnot, I'm not for sure how the clerk's office in turn handles that. Um, I think in the, 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 mayor's, the mayor's office kind of would handle that more than the clerk's office. Um, just to redirect um, Dorothy, her answer, uh, yeah, the clerk does, she's a record keeper of the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. One thing you need to know right. from the campaign, and she is, and has a lot to do with um, the ordinances that come across the table. You know that you get your ordinances Okay, wait, we got one more clerk. I understand. <laughs> I understand. I understand. I understand. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Let me, um, right. again, I'm Garland Gilchrist, and all right, let me clarify the role of the city clerk. One page in the city chart, pretty straightforward. The first set of responsibilities is to manage the voting and election process. Everything from handling voter registration, to the ballot casting process, absentee or in person, to the vote counting process. That's the first one, voting and election. The second one is the official record keeper and distributor of public information for the city of Detroit. Meaning that you should that the city clerk's job is to make information more accessible to people in Detroit. You're the keeper of the seal of the city of Detroit. Whenever a person has a question about city government operation, not county operations, so we're not talking about birth and death certificates. We're not talking about marriage licenses. We're talking about things that the city of Detroit has jurisdiction over, not the county. That's what the city clerk is responsible for giving. When you have want to have when you ask a question about city government, city ordinances, city records, you ask the city clerk that question to give that answer. The third set of responsibilities relates to clerking the city council. So that means access to the agenda of the city council meetings and hearings. Access to the minutes and transcripts from previous ones. The city clerk's responsible for putting the videos online or on the public access table channel. 
is responsible for managing the infrastructure of the city council. So, like, if y'all been to a city council meeting, y'all seen they got stacks of paper as tall as I am yes. in front of everybody, right? <laughs> so the city clerk is responsible for managing the infrastructure, so to upgrade the more than 10-year-old system that the city council uses for the legislation process to give, make it so that you can give feedback to your city council person. It is not the city council's job to tell you what the city council does. It is the city clerk's job to tell you what the city council does. The city clerk is your doorway to your entire democracy in Detroit. And so those three functions, again, focused on the city, not county or other jurisdiction responsibilities, that's my job as your city clerk. Okay. Oh, my bad, can I give you, I'll give you 30 seconds on that. Because I worked on that pro, I worked, worked on the program. So you're talking about rental property registration. Right now, less than 10% of the rental properties in Detroit are actually registered. And the city ordinance and state law says that you cannot evict somebody legally from a property that is not registered. So I actually worked and had my staff worked on the program to enable online registration for rental properties, first doing it for the first six months for free to get people to step up and then charging people for that, both the rental and the annual inspection you have to do to keep your registration current. The city clerk, if the city clerk had been doing its job, that registration process and those records could have been submitted to the city clerk's office. But one of the reasons that the scope of the mayoral, the mayor's office has expanded so much is because the city clerk's office hasn't been doing anything right. So therefore we don't trust the city clerk's office, we're trying to let the mayor do everything. The mayor does not have carte blanche responsibility for the city of Detroit. We got three branches of government and the city clerk is one of them. So with that, as your city clerk, I'll be able to step up and make those processes work better for you and be a better partner for the other branches of government. Any other questions for any of the candidates? City Council or Clerk? Well, Mayor. 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 And I would count at least 30, 40 cars a, a day when I'm there, doing at least 50. They go by my house. Now I know I've got all kinds of kids living on the street. Uh, what, what can you, can you put speed bumps up or something? I know, you, I know, you know, you have police force is kind of low, but can you do something for this? Because this isn't just on my street. This is almost on every residential street I see. Curtis Christopher Green, Mayor of Kennedy. Well, what I would try to do is try to have stiffer enforcement protocols where I would actually have the neighborhood watch to participate in, where they can have some type of system where they warn people when they're going too fast. It, it'll do, do, do the neighborhood some good, really, to be able to do that, because I've been hit by a car three times when I was a little boy. But I survived by the grace of God, but everybody isn't so lucky. So that's something that needs to be looked into, but Detroit is so vast, you know, it's, it's 140 square miles. So for that really to be something that uh, can be made priority on a stack of problems that's ridiculously high from prostitution and all the other things we were talking about earlier, it'd be so much harder to do that, but that's something we definitely could work in and, and get people in the community to be more involved with and to have some type of correspondence system where police are able to come out, you know, at a satisfactory rate to, to, to the police to try to prevent that from, from happening. Because really, to be honest, you know, uh, that happened in a split second. And right. it's so hard for you to put somebody right there. So that's pretty much all we can do is just try to get the community involved and get some type of correspondence system where police are able to come from that type of thing. That's really it. Okay, sir. That was a good question. And um, as a mayor, I would definitely follow up on your complaint. What is your, um? you don't have to give me your exact address, but you can tell me in a thousand blocks. 3,900. 3,900? Can you spell that name again? C-A-B-O-T. Okay. Okay. Well, if you vote me in, that's going to be the first street I go look at. Cabbage. Okay, we have green lights up and all this. I, I, I have a different idea for that program, the green light program, which will be much better. 
But far as the um, speed, we definitely would need to poll your area from other neighbors that see this. So we can have like, we don't want just one complaint. We want, we want several complaints, just like people file a petition to get something handled. We want several complaints, we need to poll this, and we need somebody like you to speak up and speak <coughs> out. And we also need, um, as a mayor, I would want to um, implement a program where we give a questionnaire to the citizens of Detroit instead of questionnaires given to us to answer. We want to know what your questions are. Like, in other words, we want to know what, what is your problem? What, what area do you live in? What are your um, um, uh, needs? So that's what I would do as mayor. I'll teach you a bomb, you guys. Okay. Um, to ask you a question, sir, um, once again, residential streets, I'm all for the babies and the households. <laughs> Speeding down residential street is unacceptable. One complaint gets my attention. One. I will be there. I'm a, I'm a book to guide individual. I'm all, I've always have been. And I'm really a firm believer of you do your research on your candidates. Um, like this young man said earlier, see what they already been doing, and then you'll know what they will do. Speeding down the street is totally unacceptable. Speed traps and force stricter penalties and, 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 and do what needs to be done. One complaint, we need to be over there, we need to make sure what's going on. And being the mayor of the city of Detroit, I think the mayor needs to be active, the mayor needs to be involved. Me being the mayor of Detroit will be there, right on, right, right there. The time frame that you tell me is going on, we need to be over there, meet police force, we need to be there to make sure that that's not, that does not occur. Because reason why one complaint is important, because one car kills one child. So it needs to be attended to right then and there. And, and, and once, once you, I can tell you right now, being in the city of Detroit, people know where the speed traps are at. They know where streets not to speed down. Once they once once the word get out, police is there, all of a sudden the speed the speed will stop. It will stop. EdwardDDean.com running for me your next man. Um, Celebrate our seventh year anniversary in April. 
seven and a half years now. We uh, house a bunch of kids. We have um, right now we have 186 kids registered in the summer camp. But um, the city of Detroit summer camp is $425 per child. We run a successful summer camp by only charging a child a T-shirt. This year is the only year we have not received the grant. Did I shut down my program? No. I continue to press and work hard. I actually just came from closing our summer camp when we got here. We have protected 186 kids this year in our summer camp and hired 49 youth employees and gave them a great summer camp that we give them Monday through Friday 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. and we feed them breakfast and lunch. We Not only is this a summer camp, we also teaches them entrepreneurship training, gardening, and ways to build within their city to give them the tools to survive and sustain. The same thing we want to give to the residents of the city of Detroit. We want to empower you all and let your voices be heard. That's why I'm running for the mayor of Detroit. That's why I'm the candidate for the job. I'm involved with the people. I hear the cries of the people. I live in the same troubled neighborhoods you live in. I cry like you cry. I hurt like you hurt. I knock on them same doors, but yet they go unanswered. I want to be the person on the other end to open the door for you. And like this young lady who cried out in front of us right here about her neighborhood, about her children, and want her voice to be heard. I'm the guy to open that door for you and get those answers resolved, them questions resolved. My name is Edward D. Dean, and I'm running for office, not for a position to stand out, but a position to be the voice for the people. You can reach me at edwarddean.com. Thank you for your time, District 6. delegates in District 6, thank you for this forum and thank you for having me here. Again, my name is Darlin Gilchrist II. I'm running to be your next Detroit City Clerk. And, you know, for me, I think that this is a really powerful and important position. And I think it's sad that enough Detroiters don't understand that. But the reason they don't understand it is because they haven't been served well by it. And, you know, I got, I got babies. If I didn't feed my kids, they would shrivel up and die. We haven't fed Detroiters a city clerk that can truly serve them. 
We haven't given them someone who is uniquely prepared to carry out all the functions of the office, the functions I described earlier. We haven't given them a person who they can believe will serve them with integrity. <coughs> I'm Garland Gilford II. I'm offering a chance for a different direction. I'm offering a chance for us to be able to be a powerful political force in our state. The reason that we're not is because our votes haven't been counted right for years. And a city whose votes aren't counted right is a city that's not respected politically. A people whose votes aren't counted right or who choose not to vote at all are people who are not respected politically. I'm sick of Detroit being disrespected. And part of the reason it's been disrespected is because it has not been well served. This election is an opportunity to change that, to choose, to make a choice for us to regain that respect and that power. We got people who say they've been fighting, 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 fighting. I'm sick of people fighting and not winning. Come on now. In my career, I've been fighting and winning for social justice, fighting and winning to keep families together and stop the deportation, fighting and winning to protect and expand voting rights in the face of voter suppression and fighting and winning to improve services for Detroiters. That's what we need in the city clerk's office. A person who can fight and a person who can fix. So when I say I wanna stand tall for Detroit, that means I wanna stand proudly with all of you so we can step into our power. So thank you District 6, thank you UPD, I hope to have your support for Detroit City Clerk. Woo! Mm -hmm. Okay, don't put me on camera. I mean, keep that way. Okay. <laughs> okay. Don't put me on camera. I hate that. So but we can't hear you unless I turn this. This form, it's fine, because this is to them, not to them. <laughs> <laughs> this form has been the most surprising to me because you guys have gotten straight to the point and offered genuine stories and yeah. heartfelt stories where I wanted to cry. And just a little secret, I started organizing in Southwest Detroit with this lovely little lady right here. <laughs> so, Southwest Detroit was the first city that took me in. And one thing about Southwest Detroit, I always say is that, and in, in Southwest Detroit, they are doers. That's right. Mm -hmm. Stop okay. <laughs> they are doers. They don't wait for somebody no. to come say We don't talk about it, themselves. we be about yeah. it. They they do it. Right. So they don't believe in the word task force. No, we don't believe it. Take it over. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I want to say. This has been most interesting, but I, I, I loved it. It was long, but it was great. 